in addition to the usual uh, unemployed uh, churning in the labor market, we're going to have substantial numbers of people who are structurally unemployed. That is, they have the wrong education in the wrong place in the wrong, at the wrong time. And that question is something we haven't confronted really <laughs> since the 1970s, but it's coming back, and it's very regional and geographic. Uh, that matters because politics is regional and geographic. So in the end, uh, let me just run through uh, what the data says underneath the recession. Uh, and you can see in this first slide, if you look at the difference between the blue and the brown, uh, the blue is essentially uh, uh, college, some college, AAs or better, does not include industry-based certificates, uh, which are almost equivalent in number uh, to uh, certificates from two-year schools. They're very large. Uh, what you can see there that uh, shows very clearly is since 1973, which is the first bar, uh, to 2007, which is the third bar, we've had a very substantial movement in uh, education qualifications uh, towards post-secondary. In 1973, 72 percent of people had high school or less. Uh, I can tell you when you look at their wages, they were doing fine. Uh, at that time, almost that number, uh, with high school or less, were in the middle class, if you define middle class as the five, uh, de the five deciles in the middle of the ten decile distribution. Uh, but by the time we get to 2007, uh, that share is dipped down below 40 percent. People who had some college or AAs, uh, either stayed in the middle class, about half of them. Uh, another half, another a quarter, uh, actually fell into the uh, bottom of the income distribution, and another quarter moved up uh, into the top three deciles of the income distribution. People with BAs left the middle class, but they virtually all went up. Uh, people with graduate degrees left the middle class, but they virtually all went up. So the middle class is declining but people are leaving for very different destinations and largely their destinations are driven by their educational attainment and driven by their post-secondary attainment for the most part. Uh, so what is true now is that post-secondary education has become the arbiter of access to the middle class. Uh, let me show you a couple other slides here that make this point in different ways. Uh, this is uh, this uh, set of lines here shows supply and demand for post-secondary. Uh, since 1915, this is really something we built off, for those of you who know Larry Katz's work uh, and David Oder, uh, um, we uh, uh, built this off, off their work with their help. Uh, they did a very sophisticated analysis of uh, post-secondary education demand. Uh, they did all the equations and then didn't solve them. We uh, then said, well, why don't you solve them and get the answer, and then we people will understand what you're saying. And they said, we don't do that, we're academics, because uh, <laughs> it would force us to make some assumptions. So I'm always willing to make assumptions. Um, in any event, we worked with Larry and with David Oder, and we produced this, which is essentially supply and demand for post-secondary uh, since 1915. You can see if you go to look to 19... Uh, what happens after uh, 1965 is we end up with uh, the blue line is above the red line, which is to say supply was well over demand for a fairly substantial period. That's the baby boom. Uh, in the end, that's the Vietnam War, because what happened there was a lot of men went to college because the alternative was not attractive. Uh, and then after that, what happens, and this is where Katz's analysis really bites in, I think, is that if you look at the uh, blue line, which is the supply, uh, uh, after about uh, 1990, uh, it falls underneath the red line, the demand. That is, the rate of increase in college going fell off. Basically, uh, from about 3.6% fell off to 2, and then it fell down to 1. Uh, and at that point, we began at the same time, at least measured by the wages, what people were willing to pay for college versus high school, the demand started rising. So what's happened since then is we've got a growing gap, uh, which is almost 20% now, 
between the supply and the demand for college educated workers. Um, we have run some other things which we'll share with everybody in a month or so uh, that shows what happens if we increase the supply. Uh, it does have an effect on college wages because what happens in this graph is the college wage premium, the amount a college person makes over a high school person, uh, started at about 30% uh, because of the slowdown in production and the increase in demand, went up to 82% in 2002, which is much too high by any long-term standard. A long-term standard uh, that uh, fits trend in economic growth in developed economies uh, is more like 25 or 30 percent where it was in 79. Uh, so it went too high. It then drove the earnings differences between Americans more than anything else did, more than deunionization, uh, more than the decline of manufacturing, more than the decline in the real value of the minimum wage. Uh, it was about education. So uh, what happens when you try to fix that is you're going to lower the wage premium. Uh, but in the process, you're going to get huge increases in productivity because of the quality of the workforce. And you will reduce, to the extent possible, uh, you will reduce the income inequality in the United States. A couple more graphs, and then I'll, uh, I think this is the one with the little the best paying jobs in the economy are filled by those with post-secondary education. Um, what we did here is broke jobs into three groups, uh, managerial and professional jobs, uh, middle skill jobs, which are us essentially are of sub BA and uh, above uh, high school, uh, and then low wage uh, service jobs, which is how we characterize uh, high school or less essentially. And what you can see here is that the managerial and professional jobs uh, uh, grow uh, pretty substantially. Uh, that is, uh, in the end, uh, what we have is an economy increasingly uh, dominated by these jobs, and these jobs, that is the good jobs, the red jobs, are very much associated with post-secondary education or training. That is, uh, there are some of these jobs uh, for high school graduates still. Uh, we think there are about 18 or 20 of them. Uh, so that's why there's a little red bar where it says high school graduates. Uh, there are some of these jobs for high school or GED still. Um, that's why there's a little a red bar there. But as you notice, as you go down the bars, the dominant uh, location of these jobs is in uh, cases where you have an AA degree, some college, and so on. And that is the trend, which does not bode well for those first two sets of good jobs in uh, high school graduates and some calls. Next thing is about uh, uh, men and women. Uh, I like this chart because it says a lot quickly, explains a lot of things you read in the paper that, no, that uh, get confused. Uh, if you run men and women together in America, Americans' wages are going up. Everybody's wages are going up. Um, what people do when they want to say wages are going down is they just run the men uh, because that's where the wages, as you can see in these bottom three lines, uh, which are high school dropouts, high school graduates, and some college, uh, they're performing much less well than the blue, which is bachelor's degrees, and the yellow, which is performing phenomenally uh, where, uh, for men. Women look the same, except the lines are all going up. The reason is women start low. Uh, so as women improve educational attainment, and as female wages begin to equalize, uh, it's hard to find women whose wages aren't increasing. Uh, they're low but increasing. And the other thing you see here, if you look at these two things as a set of buildings, uh, if you're a female, you need basically, it's actually more than that, but you need one more degree than a man to make uh, what a man would make. We run this in a lot of our data. We did it with the majors. Uh, in the majors, there are three out of 171 in which women make more than men. Uh, interestingly, one of them is uh, uh, in information technology and statistics. Uh, another one is in healthcare, uh, and the third one is in arts uh, and community service, which is to say the wages for men and women are both so low there that the women won by an inch. Um, <laughs> but that, that whole, uh, we find, it was rather stunning, frankly, the extent to which we found that among majors. The segregation of males and females, as well as African Americans and uh, Hispanics by 
um, by majors, really stunning, much more so than I thought it would be. Women, one final thing about that, they, they're doing well in the sense that 44% of, of uh, math majors now are female. Sorry, Larry. And the other thing is that uh, m the majority of people in statistics are female. But what we find out is they turn those degrees into teaching jobs. So they don't make the wages that a man would make if he majored in those things. But to the extent they are, they're about 50-50 as biology majors and life science majors, and when they turn that into healthcare jobs, they do fine. Not as well as men in the same jobs with the same degree, but they do fine. So the pathway out for women looks like it's healthcare. Uh, one other, a uh, couple others quickly here. Lifetime earnings from post-secondary education are high and rising. Uh, this is uh, a number that's bandied about a lot. And essentially what it shows, if you look at the top of the heap, for a professional degree uh, over a 40-year, 25 to 64 lifespan, you'll make about, uh, I think that's 3.3 uh, million dollars. Uh, and then for a doctoral degree, you'll get about 3.2. Uh, for master's degrees, it's about 2.6 falls all the way down to less than high school where total lifetime earnings, 40-year career earnings, are about 970. When you play with cost on this, the post-secondary degrees tend to be worth it, almost all of them, if you just take the earnings you don't get because you went to college, take the cost of going to college, uh, also discount that going forward, uh, and subtract it from the earnings, it's pretty hard. Uh, to get a, especially a BA that doesn't pay. If you further discount it, uh, as is often done by financiers and economists, um, by anywhere from one to four um, uh, percent, and I won't go into why that's done, I think it's actually incorrect, but I am very alone on that. Um, I think it's pretend stuff. Uh, Basically, what you assume is if people took all the money they would have spent to go to college and all the money they would have earned uh, if they hadn't gone to college and they put it in the bank and never touched it for 40 years, you t <laughs> that's, what, that's what it is. And then you subtract that from the amount of money they make because they went to college as if some kid, uh, affluent or not, thinks like that when they're graduating from high school. It's not the way the world works. Behavioral economists disagree with it, and I, would, I agree with them on that. But, but in any event, uh, college comes out pretty well, even discounted value. What that says to me is prices are going to go up and up and up and up, and college, for the most part, is always going to be worth it. The issue is how much price increase will people tolerate. The bottom line is they still get their money's worth. Uh, one, the next slide. Uh, which one is this? Oh. oh, this is just a quick one. I'll do it quick. Uh, one of the ways you look at this, if you're talking to a governor, you say, uh, look, uh, if you look at your GDP, uh, the biggest component of your GDP is wages. Um, there's other stuff in there, but wages dominate. If you look at wages over time in your state, that is your state GDP, the uh, share of, of uh, GDP from wages uh, that accrues to post-secondary is growing, and it's growing faster than post-secondary. So even though you get, let's say in this case, masters are better, they're 12 percent of the wage bill uh, nationwide, but they're 21 percent of the GDP. Uh, a college degree is 22 percent BA of the wage bill, it's 29 percent of GDP. So these are good investments. Now there's a presumption here that there are jobs for these people, um, so there's always that issue. Uh, and then uh, next, um, this is essentially the middle class slide, and I've already told you about that. Uh, if you're going, the people who were middle class uh, with high school and some college and high school dropouts have fallen out dramatically uh, over the years. Is really what this says. Um, and then the next one, I wanted to get to this because I think it's important, and that is that uh, uh, in the midst of all of this. Uh, what this chart, this green one, shows is that there's very substantial overlap. Uh, there are a lot of people who get AA degrees who make as much as BA degrees. There are a lot of people who get certificates 
who make as much as AA degrees or BA degrees. What this really tells you is it's the major and the occupation, and to a lesser extent, uh, the industry that ultimately drives the wage. This was not always true. In 1970, it wasn't like this. In 1970, the BA had a certain return. Uh, it was generally or almost always higher, uh, even in individual cases, than degrees below that. Now, uh, it's the combination of the degree, the occupation, uh, and the industry. So if you're a, the example I always use um, is that if you have a certificate from a two-year school in engineering, you'll earn more uh, than a high school teacher. Uh, you'll earn more than 10% uh, of uh, education majors who get BAs. That is 10% of BAs who are education majors. You'll earn more than almost 20% of BAs. So it's the connections between these things that matter most. And that, I think, makes the basic case. Um, thank you.